we'll, we'll jump right in here. Um, so this first section, you know, grant think, uh, a big part of my job is kind of myth busting and helping people kind of get the right mindset uh, to look for grants, to write for grants, uh, even to manage awards. Um, and so I want to just spend a little time sort of setting the context um, by talking about what, what a grant is not. So grant funding is not free money. It is not a stopgap solution and it is not abundant. So these are common like misconceptions I come across. Like I work with lots of folks in the community, business people, non, you know, grassroots nonprofits, the university, you know, and it, folks of all all types, you know, I kind of get this from all different places. So I think it's important to address. So, I mean, we all know, you know, nothing's free. Um, and so although a grant award is, you know, it's a financial instrument where, you know, a funder is going to, you know, give money to you to execute some kind of project, there's a desired impact component, you know, it's not free. I mean, the fact that you're in this call right now, learning about how to write grants is your time, right? It's your time and the capacity of your team. Um, it takes away from other things. There's an opportunity cost with grant funding, um, you know, and if you're lucky enough to get an award, you know, all the reporting that goes with it, the compliance, if you're doing government funding, which is not really going to be the focus of my remarks today, but, you know, government stuff is like even more, more heavy on the reporting, um, financial controls, you know, I'm involved with one of the local farm bureau chapters here. Um, and, you know, we're very... <laughs> We don't have QuickBooks, you know, I'm the treasurer, right? So we administered a county grant recently to do a farm to car project, which was like a farmer's market, but like during COVID. And it was hard to like, you know, it was a part-time job just trying to make sure all the money was, was managed properly and we had good paperwork. So when you're signing up for a grant award, you're signing up for a lot. Um, and so treat it as such. And, and maybe, you know, in the course of deciding whether or not you're gonna go for something, you're like, hey, this is actually too much. This is taking us too far afield. It's gonna take us away from the work. Let's find another source of funding. That's totally fine. Um, grants are not a stop gap, gap source of funding. So if your organization is like in turmoil or you have some kind of, you know, some debt that's accruing that you don't know how you're gonna pay or maybe you're getting sued or, you know, you can't make your lease rent on your facility or something like you have some kind of urgent, like emergency, like a funder does not want to give you an award to like deal with those things. So, you know, my point here is like, you really need to make sure your inner workings are solid and you can give the, the funder confidence that you're in a good position to steward those grant funds. So if you need grant money tomorrow, because you have some kind of big problem at your organization, like grant is not how to solve that. You know, maybe, maybe a low interest loan might be something to look at. So don't treat it like, you know, if I only had a grant, like everything would be fine. Because if you're saying that, then like, you're probably not going to get any kind of grant funding. Um, and they're not abundant. So something that I hear a lot in my work is like, this person got a grant and that person got a grant and there's all this grant money out there. Like it's, there is and there isn't, right? Like funders that make awards have very specific investment areas. They want to see impact in certain communities. They have certain things they want to allow the money to be spent on and not. And like, when you go through the list of all the caveats, right? All the little nitty gritty details, there isn't all that much money out there. You know, there's not that much money out there for what you're trying to do specifically. So let's not treat it like it's this abundant resource because it's not. And competition increases every single year, right? Funders want to be seeing new applicants. The government, the way the government works is like the more applicants they get for these grant programs, the more they can justify to Congress that they need to get more money allocated. So the, you know, the USDA, I work a lot on USDA programs and like they want application volume. So like five years ago, you know, a program that I would write for, maybe there would be 150 applications. Now they're topping 500 applications, right? So you have to be upping your game every single year because there's more people vying for the same, the same number of awards, like more or less. And so I think this is just good, like real talk to keep in mind. 
as you like set out on your, your grant seeking journey. Um, and so this slide is really addressing how do you become like a smart grant seeker? Like, how do you think about it in a way that's going to help you get to where you're going? Um, and I think a key thing is like funders are investors in impact. And you, you all know this, like you all are seem like very seasoned professionals, right? Like, it's just like any collaboration. It's like the what's in it for me component, right? And so if funders are investors in impact, you know, they may not be asking you, well, what's my return on investment? Like, I'm going to give you 10 grand and you're going to turn it into 50,000 50, in profit. Like, that's not what they're asking. They're saying, what are you doing for the community? What are you doing for the food system? How are you measuring that? And so when you treat your funder like a co-investor in your impact, you know, these are the questions that you kind of want to ask yourself, right? What resources does your organization bring to the table, right? This isn't like Oliver Twist, like waiting for a handout, you know, that's not how it works. Um, and if you have that expectation, you probably won't be successful. So it's like, what are you bringing to the table? What makes you different and effective? And by you, I mean your organization or your project. Um, you know, what, what, what sets you apart from the other people in the space that are kind of addressing the same thing? How do you work with those people? How do you differentiate? And why are you seeking funding? All right. So there's this classic story that's like, you know, a business owner needs a loan. They walk into the bank, the banker says, how much do you need? And they say, how much will, however much you'll give me, <laughs> which is not the answer, right? Like you have to kind of know, like we're seeking $40,000 to execute this project. You know, we've secured this much money from another source, like really paint the picture for how this funder's money is going to be used and like to what end. And if, if you can't answer these questions, how is the funder going to feel confident in your ability to steward those funds, right? So it's kind of like a shark tank. If we think about that show shark tank, like the entrepreneurs are doing the same thing to the investors, but in our case, we're doing it with funders. And kind of the last setup point that I have here is like grant funding takes time to come to fruition. So, you know, give yourself a year. I think that's like a solid amount of runway to like get your feet under you, do some research, maybe try some things. Um, maybe it's not successful, but at least you, you know, you're being realistic in terms of your time horizon, because if you're in a situation where you need money now and it's just, it's just usually, you know, you're looking at like a six to 12 month time horizon, a lot of times in terms of like money in the door on these grants. And so knowing that it's like, we can kind of hedge our bets and like have realistic expectations. And when we approach it that way, we tend to be more successful. Right. So just some like words of very young wisdom, um, that I've learned like in my journey especially working on federal, federal grants. Um, but I do have foundation experience as well. Um, so I just wanted to pause here. And if anyone has any, you know, initial comments or questions about what we just covered, I'd, I'd be happy to open it up for dialogue. No, anybody? <laughs> That's okay. We'll have other opportunities um, as we move. So grant research, this, this came up in the poll. Um, oh, I see Joseph put a question in the chat there. Um, thanks, Joseph. Um, let me just move the chat box. Okay, sorry. So in the poll, you know, folks said, how do we, how do we find the funding? And this is a big piece of the success equation. So I have several slides on this. If you bear with me, I think you'll find it useful. Um, grant research, all about finding the right fit, right? Um, you know, kind of my, the, the, the context or the framework we want to use here in our mindset is like eyes on the prize, find the signal through the noise, most grant programs are not applicable to your work. So please be discerning. So this goes back to the like grants are everywhere. And why can't I get one like attitude? So 
grants are usually very specific. Funders have an issue area or like a region. We'll talk more about this, but there's something in particular they're looking to fund. And if you're not that, there's no amount of like wishful thinking that's going to like take you there. So what we need to do is again, you know, we're not talking a lot about like internal organizational development on this call, but you know, look at what it is you're trying to do. What do you bring to the table? What are you good at? You know, I like to call it your shine sheet, like squeaky clean shine, your shine sheet. Like what's your highlight reel of the things like your chapter has done in the last five or 10 years, um, you know, that really validates why you should, you know, receive an award to like continue the work or how are you innovating or evolving? And so you really need to know what the prize is that you're going for, right? Like, what is the end that you're, you're seeking? And then that's going to kind of dictate the means, which would be the different funders that are really aligned to that, that end game that you have, right? Um, and so that's kind of what I mean by eyes on the prize here, because um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise in the grant space. There's a lot of people that talk about you know, it's life is like this, right? Like people talk, say a lot of things and you just take it with a grain of salt because you're like, I don't think you really know what you're talking about or have you actually done it? Um, and a lot of people haven't and a lot of people have. And so I think the key is to just really know it for yourself. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Um, but you just got to find that signal through the noise because you can go off in a totally waste of time direction and it's very frustrating for you and your teams and your volunteers like when we're not just like honing in on what it is we need out of this you know grant seeking process so don't worry it's not fear of missing out if the grant isn't the right fit for your work so i i kind of look at lots of different grants all the time and i get really excited about certain grants but it's totally a field of what i do you know art conservation or museum restoration, things like that. Like not my field, but I'm like, wow, this is such a great grant. Like I'd love to write for this, but it, you know, it's not my field. Um, so don't worry, your, your grant is out there. We just have to find it. Um, so this is how I like to describe like the, the sources of grant funding. So when people are like, oh yeah, a grant, it's like, okay, but like what kind, like from where? you know, what's the order of magnitude, et cetera. So on the left here, you know, government, government's the biggest grantor in the country. Um, but oftentimes what happens with federal money is like, they'll give it to like states. Uh, and then the states, it's kind of like a trickle down, you know, situation. So I think the key with government is like, usually it's restricted to like geography so if you're in like a large municipality, you know, Detroit, for example, there's lots of giving activity in Detroit. It's specific to Detroit. Maybe it's um, just Michigan as a whole, but like, that's usually how you work the government stuff is like the where, like, where are you? And then you start kind of following the agencies, find where this money is being placed and, and how they're giving it out. So governments will give out money in different ways. Um, I have the 34 billion here. This is just the take of the U.S. Farm Bill. So since this is slow food, um, the U.S. Farm Bill, you know, five-year omnibus legislation, it's a $428 billion with a B allocation that Congress makes. Um, of that money, 75%, some of you may know this, 75% of it goes to like our nutrition benefits. So like SNAP and WIC, um, senior um, nutrition vouchers, things like that. 75% of the 428 billion, which is fantastic. Um, but then when you really start to cut the pie up, about 34 billion of it is given in the form of like grant programs and cooperative agreements. Um, so, you know, it's a lot, but it's not a ton. Um, conversely, the charitable foundations, you know, in 2021, they gave about a hundred billion dollars um, in the US, and these charitable foundations, philanthropic foundations, you know, you can kind of slice and dice them different ways. You have your big international givers like Bill and Melinda Gates, as an example. The Packard Foundation is another example. You have like your national foundations. Uh, you know, I think the Ford Foundation is a good example. Um, Kresge is a good example. Um, 
and then you have community, my typo, I thought I fixed that, excuse me. Um, community foundations, I think is gonna be your sweet spot, you know, kind of given the scale of the chapters and it seems like you, you all kind of work in very specific places. So community foundations are a great avenue. I think corporate foundations as well, certain corporations, especially, you know, on the mainland, like, you know, there's big companies in certain communities and they want to give back. Um, and so if you have one of these corporations in your region, they can be a source of grant funding that isn't that competitive. Um, and then issue area. I think the classic one is like animal welfare. I mean, there's so many foundations that give to animal welfare. It's a very worthy cause as they all are, but there's just certain areas, you know, ch childhood education is another one um, where there's just so much money. And then I think, you know, food systems, it's starting to come into more fashion, I think as of late, um, but just historically um, there's kind of these heavy hitting issue areas. So you'll see a lot of foundations in your research, a lot of animal welfare. <laughs> it's just not, I mean, it might be relevant, but usually it's around like cats and dogs. It's not about like livestock. Um, Okay, and then the last piece is like these major donors. So this might be stuff that you're familiar with. Um, and when we take a pause, maybe we can chat about, you know, maybe some of the grants that you have received and where they came from. Um, major donors, so these are just like phil individual philanthropists. Oftentimes, you know, their, their giving share for 2021 was like $34 billion, um, sizable. And usually they'll park their money at like a community foundation and they'll have what's called like a donor advised fund. And so, there's more flexibility with these donors. They're not, the funds aren't like set up in a foundation. There isn't like a board. It's more at their discretion. Sometimes they're called discretionary funds. Um, so, you know, I think slow food because your, your groups are so relationship based and everyone's united around the vision and the values, like this could be a really good avenue. Um, getting to know people that have donor advised funds at local community foundations. Another thing you can do is what the, what the donor, what the donors will do is they park the money at the community foundation. And then the community foundation has staff and the, and the donor says, okay, I'm interested in investing or in um, doing grant making in these areas. So you go out there and find some prospective grantees for me. So the foundation staff that administer these donor advised funds are kind of like the gatekeepers to the donors. That's one way. And then the other way is you just, you find out who they are and you build that relationship over time. Um, so this is kind of the grant scheme in like a simplified high level breakdown, right? So you kind of need to know the nature of what it is you're going for, right? Cause a, cause a government thing is going to work differently than a foundation thing. And then what kind of foundation are you targeting? And then major donor, it's, it's more of like a re, like relationship um, by invitation type of thing. So given that, uh, how do we like find, <laughs> find these awards? Um, I like this quote from Yogi Bear. I'm a big baseball fan. Uh, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. So this is again, back to like, what is it you're trying to fund? You know, what is it you're trying to do? And just all of that, like from, the, from the big, like vision mission down to the operations and the tactics that you're using, like you got to have an idea of where it is you're trying to go because the funder is not going to tell you that. And if you don't have that figured out, it's going to be hard to be successful. Right. Um, if you want to do the grant thing as a source of funding. So with the internet, it's much easier to find awards, um, nowadays, especially with government, um, but there's several databases and folks may be familiar with these, um, but, you know, in tried and true practice, this is what I find to be effective in, in terms of turning up new prospective awards. And I've been through these databases a lot and I still kind of come across new things. So I think it's a good kind of constellation of, of resources here. So Grant Station and Foundation Center Online, um, these are like directories. And there's a fee. Grant Station is very affordable. Highly recommend it for like small organizations, grassroots. Foundation Center Online is kind of overbuilt. It's more for like community community foundations themselves will subscribe to Foundation Center Online. It's like 
over a thousand dollars, I think, of annual subscriptions, a lot. Um, Grand Station's like a couple hundred bucks. Um, and so this basically is a repository of information about local um, philanthropic foundations. They have information about government grants. Um, they have the Grand Station also has information about like business plan competitions. So like nonprofit business plan competitions or like these like innovation challenges where it's more like a like a competition type of program versus like a, a traditional like proposal based award. It runs the gamut of kinds of stuff that's out there. And so I, I highly recommend Grant Station as a starting point. Um, Philanthropy News Digest is a free service that you can sign up for. Um, I, I, I receive these emails, it's really great. And what they do is they like aggregate requests for proposals or RFP, um, basically calls for proposals, solicitations, it's all the same thing. Um, yeah, the, the PND, they, they aggregate RFPs from like all different fields. So what you do is you go in and customize your areas of interest and then they'll just generate emails with RFP notifications. It's like passive research, it's great. And it's really good quality, it's not junk. Um, it, it, it's, it's very good, I, I really like it and it's free. So if you're just starting out on the research path, I'd, I'd recommend you know signing up for a PND News Digest. You can get it weekly, you can get it daily. Um, and that'll just give you a sense of like what's out there. Um, and also if you're interested, you could open the RFPs and read them and then that'll make you a better grant seeker too. Uh, cause you can see how different solicitations are structured. Um, open 990. So this is for like our Nancy Drews in the house, um, and our Sherlock Holmes. Like if you really want to get into like the dirty laundry, so to speak of these different foundations, go look at their 990. Um, you know, it gives you information, like where is their headquarters? Who is their highest compensated officers? Like oftentimes the, the 990s will have an itemized list of all the grants that they gave. Um, cause sometimes it's hard to discern like how many are they giving or order of magnitude, like what's the average award size and grant station provides some of this information, which is really cool, but other times they don't. And so if you want to get a better sense of like, is this totally out of my league or it seems like they only give to like three organizations and they're, you know, they're this kind of organization, like a national type of group and your local, like you can kind of get into the nitty gritty. So open 990, um, there's a few different websites. 990s are publicly available documents, um, but you can go there if you really want to get into it. Um, and then good old Google search, like use the keyword function. And, you know, after you kind of think about what, what project you're looking to fund or, um, you know, what, what the mission is of your particular chapter, you know, you can kind of plug those keywords in and, you know, just start seeing what comes up. And then I'm going to show you how to organize that. That's the next slide. Um, you know, on the flip side, the, the people component, right? So we can go out there and we can research online. And, you know, one of the key things with grant success over time is the relationships that you build, um, just like with anything in life. So get creative on like how you get information. So one of the things you can do is like, look at similar organizations that, you know, maybe they did something that was funded or, you know, someone on their board and kind of get some info, like, mm -hmm. Hey, like, you know, who's that funder or, you know, what, what, what grants are you guys looking at this year? Like, is a, is there a way we could collaborate on something really big, like maybe a big government grant or something? Um, you also can check their annual reports. <laughs> so if you, if you have like larger competitors in the space, um, you know, you can see usually they itemize their donors and their annual reports, and you can start putting your strategy together for how to get at those people or foundations. Um, like I said, foundation staff and events is a great way to stay in the loop. Um, foundation staff are there to serve you. Uh, they don't have a job unless grant making is happening. So, you know, you're not a bother to them. You know, some foundations will be like, don't contact us. Like, please just don't. Um, but most of them are very happy to engage with community. I think it's especially true with community foundations. So really buddy up with folks in the field. And then that way they have you in mind when things come up or when they're designing new grant-making initiatives, it's like, hey, you know, like 
slow food is doing this really innovative thing. Like maybe there's room for, you know, a dimension of local food systems in this upcoming grant making thing that we didn't consider. So you can inspire the, the grant makers um, with your work, right? But it takes time to do that. You know, follow news. Again, Philanthropy News Digest is a good place to start. Sign up for newsletters. I mean, all the usual things um, that you guys probably already do. You know, network with scholars and leaders. So people at universities and stuff or at like kind of like nonprofit institutes or like think tanks, you know, they have access to larger pools of funding um, that maybe your community organization just, you're just not at the size or the scope. Um, that would be required to unlock some of that funding. So if you work with like researchers and the researchers need like boots on the ground for a project, or, you know, I think one of the things we're seeing, especially with the pandemic is like community led solutions to these like systemic problems that we have. And, you know, researchers can only do so much, like there has to be an applied component. And I think the community has to be a part of that, right? So I think there's really neat stuff that you could do like with your institutions. Um, and even if they like throw you a little contract money, like, hey, that's money. And then you're not on the hook to do all the reporting, right? So collaboration is good in the field. Um, talk to your fellow chapter board members. I think, well, I think in another session, um, you guys are gonna have the opportunity to kind of share tips and tricks. I think that's super valuable. And then people like me, you know, people that do grant writer, uh, grant writing or fundraisers, um, fundraisers, the people, you know, we, you know, there's, it's impossible to know everything about the field. So I think one word of caution is like, if you do hire a consultant, like they're pretty much working off of exactly what I'm telling you right now. So it's, it's not like you need so much expertise to do this well. Um, I think you just have to care and like know it for yourself. And then that way, when you do talk to a consultant, it's like, you're very clear on what you're asking them and they're giving you feedback. It's not like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like you do it consulting. Cause that doesn't always lead to success either. Cause the consultant, they can only know so much. And if you bring stuff to the table for them, the likelihood of you being successful is going to be greater. So I think if you work this process, you'll find like hiring that grant writer to execute a proposal is actually going to be more fruitful in the end because you did you your organization internally did the work on the front end to really understand the landscape. And that knowledge doesn't go away, right? So we're building this capacity. We're doing research. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, you know, some of the key criteria to look for. So like, let's say you're on Google and you're looking for awards or you're in the grant station interface. It's very intuitive to use if you, if you sign up for a subscription, um, you know, things you want to be on the prowl for like red flags or like green lights, missionary alignment, number one, like if they don't give to what you do, don't try to make it fit, just move on. Applicant eligibility is a huge one. So I'm not sure how the individual chapters are organized. Like if you guys have your own 501c3s or if it's a mixed bag, like some of you have fiscal sponsors, like whatever it is, there's no right or wrong way. It's just like the funder may be very particular, like must be 501c3. Or like another thing that I see a lot is like must be an organization that has an annual budget under 500,000 or something, right? Like there's all these things that they can say about your applicant. Your board must be majority native Hawaiian led. That's one in Hawaii that comes up. So just being really clear, is my organization eligible? Right? It, it, it seems like a simple question, but this is one of the main reasons people are not successful because they're not eligible. And sometimes it's, it's something you can't change. Other times it is, right? Like if it's board composition and you're like, okay, you know, we need to be majority women led, let's say. And you have like, you're like one off, <laughs> you have one extra person in there or whatever it is, you know, um, over time you can rectify that and say, okay, we think this funder is a really good funder for us, but like, we're just missing the mark on this one thing. So let's fix it. Other things you can't change, you know, and then if you can't change it, you gotta move on. Um, geography, you know, this is key. I think this is really key for the chapter level. Um, you know, in Hawaii, we have you know, a cachet of local funders that give in Hawaii, but 
when I look at RFPs from around the country, there's, there's so much giving activity. And even in these small communities, these small rural counties, you know, I see stuff out of Oregon and New England and like the Southeast. And you're just like, oh man, that sounds like such a good program for someone working in that place. So really understand what is the geographic reach of where you work. And then that's going to uncover and kind of do a lot of the sorting for you, right? Because there's only so many people in a given geography that are doing the work in your field that are the right fit for this funder. So you're, you're really reducing the competitor pool when you can hone in on these like alignment criteria. Um, giving history is important. So you'll come across, as you're doing your research, you're gonna come across all these foundations. A lot of them are like, they don't have a website or there isn't a ton of information about them in the news. And so sometimes I found with, especially the smaller foundations where it's maybe like a husband and wife that set it up, you know, maybe they made money in real estate or something and they wanted to like leave a legacy. Like they're giving like small money, like it's, you know, two grand, like they'll do like four $2,000 grants in a year. Nothing wrong with that. But knowing that, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to pursue them, it would be kind of good to know, like, how much they're giving, how frequently they're giving. Some foundations only give one a grant, one grant a year. And like, if, if you don't think you're it, then like, don't bother, you know, move on. So the 990 can tell you that information. Um, use of funds is really important. So certain funders are like no equipment, no construction. We don't do matching grants, like all, you know, whatever. The, the list goes on and on. And it's specific to every funder. So there isn't like, all grants are this way. Like it's the opposite. It's, it completely depends. And so that's why this research process and understanding like the funders parameters is so important for success. Cause if you don't do this right, you could write a great proposal. They're going to throw it in the trash and say, whatever, you're not eligible. You're trying to do ineligible things with the money, et cetera. So understand what the restrictions are. Um, is the application public or by invitation? So, you know, public is always good. You can just throw your hat in the ring, put your best foot forward by invitation. You know, maybe you have to send them some kind of letter or like you call the office and you're like, Hey, I came across your organization and blah, blah, blah. Um, but understand what that process is because a by invitation process is going to take longer to get you to a grant award than something that's public with like, okay, this is due February 14th. Like let's get an application in. Um, and the competition is going to be different too in those environments. And then is it, is it, is there a hard deadline or is it rolling? So just vocabulary, you know, rolling, you know, they kind of accept applications throughout the year and then they hold it for like a board meeting and they decide, um, deadline deadline is very important in the government space. It needs to be a fair competition. So deadline, 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 um, you got to get it in by the deadline. There, there's no non-negotiable. <laughs> and oftentimes the reason people's applications don't get funded because it wasn't turned in on time. Um, so yeah, this is, so, you know, I, I know I'm talking a lot here and it's a lot of information. It seems very basic, but that's what it is. It's very basic. You know, it's like go into the database, start plugging in some keywords, start playing with the search terms. And then when you start finding different things coming up where you're like, okay, this might be a fit, this might be a fit. These, this is how you vet it is like, you know, and you could think of other things too, to vet it. You kind of develop your own process based on going through, um, going through the research and you become better over time at like kind of calling what's, what's a fit and what's not. So I have one last, I have two more slides in this section. So I'll just breeze through these and then maybe we can break and have a little dialogue. Um, so you're, you're in Grand Station trying to stay organized, you know, you're doing this research, it's time that you could be spent spending doing other things. So we wanna make sure that the information is getting logged somewhere and that it's building capacity. It's building, you know, the, the institutional knowledge of your chapter, let's say, or if you, your organization, if you do this for your work, um, you know, and it's building the capacity of your team to actually like execute. <laughs> when the time comes, right? So you don't need anything fancy. You can do a spreadsheet, you can do a Word doc, you know, calendars are good for ma managing deadlines. Um, paper file and binders is how it was done back in the day. Um, I tend to not do it this way, but it's up to you, whatever works for you. 
Um, Asana is a great tool. You might be familiar with this. Airtable is another one. It's a little bit more complicated to use, but it's good. Um, I think monday.com, you pay for that. Uh, there's an endless list of productivity tools out there to help you get organized. But I think the key is do what works for you and your team. Like don't make it harder on yourself by using something that no one wants to use. <laughs> so usually a spreadsheet is where people end up landing. And so this is like a very low tech example of how to track this stuff. And I'm sure in your project management, you're doing similar things. Like none of this is rocket science. It's all doable. You don't need to pay a consultant to do it for you as long as you have the time. Um, so these are like real foundations, you know, you can structure this any way you want, whatever is important to your organization. These are kind of the usual things, but do, you know, make it what you want. It's a spreadsheet, um, you know, the funders use of funds, you know, what they fund, you know, what kind of application, the deadline, et cetera. Um, and the purpose of this is to capture and organize key information. Uh, also a side-by-side -side comparison of like, you've gone and done all this research, right? You're collecting, you're like, you're rooting out things that might be a good fit. And then you're going to load them into this spreadsheet. And then you're going to say, okay, we can't possibly apply to all 35 of the potential funders that we identified. So how are we going to make a short list? How are we going to pick five maybe um, from this long, the long list? Cause the long list is good. You want the long list, but then when it comes time to like chart out your year or like manage your staff, it's like, we got to hone it. Right. And then that long list is there for the future. Right. Maybe there's something that's, it's not now it's for later kind of thing. So this helps you kind of prioritize. It's useful for creating an action plan. And then you can identify synergies and ways to work together because oftentimes like grants are all due on the same day. And so that's like a log jam situation. And so as a team, you know, if, if you have like two or three really good things that are all due in a short span of time, you know, you gotta, you gotta plan for that, right. In order for you to be successful, because the goal is to be successful. Um, and so an organizer like this can kind of help get you there and get, and get it in a place where everyone's looking at the same thing and thinking about things in the same way. Um, okay. So I think that's this section. So why don't we open it up? I see lots of stuff in the chat that I have been ignoring. <laughs> um, but Lauren, if there's a question from the chat or if someone wants to unmute, I'm happy to open it up for comments and questions. Yeah. I'm happy to go after, I'm oh, sorry, I just said, I'm happy, to, I have a question, but I'm happy to go after the, uh, the chat question. All right, thank you so much, Adam. Um, I will cue you. Um, I see two in the chat that um, I want to get back to. Um, Lisa was asking, is there a preferred process or tried and true method you use to distill the vision when starting off? I think Lisa, please jump in if I'm um, misunderstanding you, but maybe you're speaking to the uh, process of, of ap applying to a grant or, or researching a grant. Yeah, well, kind of both. I'm obviously uber newbie. <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't want to go too, too broad. But um, yeah, in terms of distilling the, the focus down, is there, is there a tried and true, you know, systematic thing that you try to an outline or something rough outline that you try to stick to to make sure that you're falling within certain buckets? Or is that all driven by the type of grant that you're pursuing? That's a great question. I think, you know, we're, I'm not really addressing it here, but, you know, things like visioning sessions with your board and your members, you know, what, what is usually called a strategic plan. Um, you know, uh, if you do like retreats with your board where you all get around and you're like, okay, like, what do we want to spend the next couple years working on? Or, in five years from now, like what, what are the conditions that we would like to see, like, you know, in the, the St. Louis local food scene or something like that comes from you, from you all. And there's no wrong or right way to do it. And it definitely should not be dictated by what kinds of funding is out there. You know, I think organizations fall into that trap a lot where it's like, well, this grant is sort of about this. So let's design a program to that. 
Um, but it's actually a lot easier to do it the other way around. And so, you know, to your question, um, you know, that vision, I don't know if slow food, ha I'm sure slow food USA has like its master vision statement and like kind of the parameters of what the chapters do um, in this case. And so you could use that as a starting off point and then say, okay, well, in my region, this is how that would look. These are the things that are, we're dealing with in my region. And then from there, your, your kind of your programs or like the activities that you do are going to follow. Like, how are we going to address these specific things where we are? Um, and then you, that's kind of your, your core. And then from there, it's like, all right, let's go see what's out there. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, and I think uh, deeper into your session, we're gonna go over like outlines, right? So maybe that'll help to Lisa when you're thinking about programs and potential funding. Um, Karen was asking, is there a free site for government grants? Um, I know GrantStation is a little pricey, is there? And, and I know, Megan, you, you spoke about agencies. Maybe you can highlight some of the agencies that in particular could support slow food work. Yeah, so the banner website for federal government funding is grants.gov. It's free, you never have to pay. Um, what's hard about grants.gov is you need to kind of know what you're looking for. So if you, so then it's like, I don't know what I'm looking for, I'm going to grants.gov, so it's one of those things. Um, so I find that if you're not familiar with like federal funding, I think it's much more effective to go to the agency's websites where they kind of provide a more user-friendly um, like landing pages about each of the programs they offer. <clears throat> and you can kind of dig in from there and then you'll find like, if something is live, it'll end up linking you to the grants.gov portal, which is where you actually like submit things. And it's not very user-friendly um, for like research because you really need to know what you're looking for. Um, which is not helpful. So I think on like local food work, you know, USDA is going to be like your kind of your biggest champion. Um, and USDA has 26 different offices, the U S department of agriculture. So a couple rel relevant ones would be like the agricultural marketing service. It's called the AMS. Uh, I think rural development, they call that RD. Um, I think uh, NIFA, which is the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Some people call it NIFA. I call it NIFA. Um, but those are, those are, they have like user-friendly websites. So I would start there and kind of get a sense of like, how does the government communicate about its programs? Um, and then, you know, other agencies, you know, you might be looking at like the Department of Human Services. If you're doing like, you know, work with like at-risk communities. There might be some really creative stuff there. Um, I think another one is like the Environmental Protection Agency. They have some pretty neat stuff depending on, kind of depends what you're doing, but it, it, you know, it touches environment. So um, those are kind of some out of the box ideas. Great, thank you. Adam, do you want to ask your question next? Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Um, and thank you, Megan. This has been really helpful. Um, I really appreciated the overview. I recently moved back here from um, to Minnesota two years ago, and I worked for a community foundation out in Colorado. So I was one of those staff members kind of that you were talking about where I managed donor advised funds and would um, help out with the grant allocation money and learned a lot, obviously, through like that process. But now I'm on the other side of the coin of being a grant seeker rather than more of a grant distributor. And my question is related to money that can be allocated for 501c3s um, for an individual versus a collective whole. So I'm affiliated with uh, Slow Food Minnesota, and yesterday um, was the national screening of this documentary that we had been working on with some local farmers, and it was the first time it was kind of shown to the public. And a few of the Minnesota um, leadership members were talking about the idea, and it was just kind of a wild idea, how cool would it be to um, look for a grant that could promote or assist in some of the farmers or people from that documentary going to Terra Madre in the fall. And to my knowledge, when I worked for the Community Foundation, you the only time you could really give grant money that would be 
promoting or benefiting an individual would be through a scholarship. Someone, you know, going to school and helping that person. But you can't, you wouldn't be able to give money to help someone that's running a trail race for environmental advocacy group to raise awareness. It couldn't, the money couldn't be promoting that one individual person. So my question is, is it possible to still apply for grants that would send a group of people like over to Terra Madre, hypothetically, if you're not making it specific to the individual, but saying this lump sum of money is to help, you know, 10 farmers attend an international event for slow food. I just, I know it's kind of a specific technical question, but I've always been curious about it. No, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And it's great to know that you have community foundation experience. I've never worked for a foundation. So I just kind of know from the outside, um, and my organization does a little bit of grant making. So I'm, I'm starting to kind of see it from that seat, but it's, I'm not, I've never worked for a foundation. So you can, you can call me out if what I'm saying is inaccurate. Um, yeah, but to your question, you know, I think there, there's a lot of funders. I have an example in the slide deck where they don't want, they don't want to have anything to do with conferences. Um, that's a common thing. Cause it's like a one-off thing. And they're like, I don't want my money going towards something that's going to come and go. And so my instinct or my initial kind of reaction to what you're saying or idea is, is there a way that you could kind of couch it in like a, like a cohort experience for these farmers where, you know, there's a little bit of like pre-conference engagement, or maybe there's like a needs assessment component or something, you do something with them. And then they, you know, they're, maybe there's a presentation that they're giving at the conference. And then there's something post-conference that's going to exist in perpetuity, um, where the, where there's going to be like a greater impact. Um, you know, th that's one way that you could sell it. I think another way in terms of like your budget is you describe it as like a participant support cost. Um, whether it's like a travel stipend, I think it's much more credible to have some of these individuals, you know, maybe they pay half of their way. Mm -hmm. And then there's a stipend on the other end. Um, I think funders are more comfortable with when you frame it kind of like that. That's my initial, but yeah, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker is what I'm saying. I think it could work um, presented in the right way to the right funder. That's great. I like the, what you said about in something in perpetuity, kind of leaving it more permanent. So that makes sense. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, okay, we're at 1055. I have you guys till 1130. So I will um, try to pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, I know you guys are all with me here. So grant writing methods to the madness. This might be kind of helpful um, in terms of like the, ta the tangibles. So right now we our head is in the right space. We've like found some funders that are a good fit. We've like run them through the gauntlet of vetting. And so now we're like, okay, we're going to go right. <laughs> so this is like where the fun, the fun happens. Um, and so, you know, lots of different awards, lots of different funders, all the little details. It depends. Generally, this is what your, your proposal is going to consist of. So the proposal, you have your application package, which is like all of it together. And then the proposal is specifically that narrative component where you are writing about your organization history, previous accomplishments, what is your mission, who do you serve, those kinds of things. Statement of need or opportunity. So what is the problem you're trying to address or what is the opportunity that you see? Um, I think oftentimes this tends to take a negative slide and you know, again, we're trying to treat our funders like investors. So if you tell the funder, this problem is so big and it's so bad, they're going to be like, well, I'm not going to give you my money to solve it because it doesn't seem like you're solving it very well if it's so bad. So you got to be careful. That's why I like to call it a statement of opportunity, right? Because it's like, we have an opportunity to educate people about access to fresh, healthy, local food, not you know, the underbelly of that. So it, there's a balance there. Um, you got to keep it positive when you can. So the kind of the core of your application is going to be your activities and your evaluation. So other terms that are used are like your outputs and your outcomes. Um, outputs are basically what you do. Hosted five workshops, um, you know, provided after school care for a hundred children, you know, worked with 30 farmers to you know, go through USDA group gap, like whatever it is, it's more like the numbers and, and like the, what are you doing? And then the outcomes are like, 
what is the impact, right? So what does it mean? Why is it significant? And so this is the core of your proposal. Like if this isn't solid, the rest of it, it doesn't matter. So we'll, I'll talk about that a little more. Um, qualifications of personnel is an increasingly important part of your proposal because funders were not born yesterday. A lot of funders have given money to organizations that squandered the money and didn't do what they said they were gonna do or it was like slapdash and disappointing. So funders like are very much looking for successful investments, right? Like invest, investments and impact. So how, how do you get there? It's the quality of your team, right? The experience that you all bring to the table and you all have ton of experience. It doesn't have to be like, and you can be super creative with this too. But like the point is in your proposal, you need to make sure everybody's resumes are updated. You have little bio sketches for the core team. Like who's on the board? Like what is what has their tenure been like? Things like that, because it really can make or break the proposal. Um, and it's also kind of a pain to like, oh, I see another typo in here. I'm not following my own rules. Sorry. Um, it can be a pain to like, uh, scramble for this information, like right before the thing is due. So like, what is it, what are all the degrees that everybody has? How many years of experience do they have? It doesn't matter what kind of experience, just experience, right? Like if you can say that everyone on your leadership team has over 15 years of experience, that's going to look a lot better than like you know, a couple of college students, like nothing against college students, but like someone with less experience, right? And the government really pays attention to this. So just don't underestimate the, the importance of this. Um, project budget and then like program sustainability. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. That is really important, the budget. Um, and then you're supporting documents and information. So every funder is going to want different things. It's all in the solicitation. Um, and so I'll talk about what, how to, how to deal with the solicitation here. Um, all right, this is a sequential order. It's like one, two, three. I tried to put the numbers in, but it messed with my formatting. So we're starting here on the left. Step number one of proposal writing is reading the solicitation, okay? Another word for solicitation, RFP, CFP, RFA. Um, the government uses NOSA, which stands for Notice of Solicitation Announcement. NOFA, Notice of Funding Announcement. Instructions. It's the instructions for what it is you need to do to get your thing put together in like the time, place, and manner that it must be submitted, okay? It's really hard to write a proposal without reading the instructions. It sounds very simple. People don't do it and they fail. So this is something you absolutely can control and you don't need a ton of experience like to do, right? Um, if you're really good at instructions, that's like half the battle of, of grant writing and you'll find that. So we want to close read and annotate. So I was an English major in school, pretty much just became a professional annotator where you have to close read stuff. And like every single word, you know, I like to print the solicitations. I'm not a big paper person when it comes to my grant process, but the solicitation, I really find it helpful to print, get a highlighter go through, you, you know, you're, you're, we're looking for all the key things that we've discussed. What do you have questions about? What is not clear? Like there's always going to be, you know, not always, but oftentimes there's two or three really pivotal questions about eligibility. Are these activities allowable? How do I calculate the match? Oftentimes with foundation awards, there's no match, but with government grants, it's like, and if you just assume that you understand what this thing is saying, but you really deep down in your gut are like, I don't understand, like you need to get that question answered. Because if, if the answer is something that's going to make you not eligible, you, it, it's better to know that now than like after you've spent 80 hours working on something that frankly was failure to launch from the beginning, but you didn't ask. So don't be scared to ask. Um, this is where grant consultants are helpful. Um, you know, you know, just having that kind of experience, it might be a run of the mill question that comes up a lot, but maybe it's your first time encountering this is especially true with government funding, but like ask questions and then check the rubric. So I have a slide on rubrics, but the way that proposals are kind of evaluated is usually against some set of standards. 
So like how they taught us in, in school, like you got to write to the rubric to get an A on the, on the essay, right? So it's the same thing with grants and the rubrics, rubrics change based on the funder you're applying to. So it's all specific to that proposal. So once we've read the solicitation, we really understand the instructions, right? Like then we're ready to create our work plan and our budget. This is your second step. Do not wait until the end to do the budget. That's what everybody does that I see when early on, because the budget's scary. I don't know what I'm supposed to put in the budget. You know, my, my CFO is supposed to work on the budget and they just haven't gotten to it. So I'll just busy myself with the rest of the proposal and then the budget will just deal with it later. Don't do that. Um, you got to tackle it head on because the activities and the budget and the impact all have to align together, right? Because you're asking for money to do something. And so that budget needs to reflect what the activities are, right? So like, like to the example of like traveling to the conference, like if you, you know, you say you're going to like, or a workshop series might be a better example. So in your activity plan, you're saying, oh, we're going to host like a series of dinners with like a guest speaker and, you know, it's going to be a traveling film tour or something. And then like the budget is like, you're trying to buy a tractor and like, there's money for some like branding consultant. And it's just like, what, like, what are they spending money on? And like, how are they actually going to do this stuff? If that's their budget, like, it has to make sense. And you know, it's, it's just like grocery shopping. It's like, if you're gluten-free, you're not gonna be buying things with gluten. So it's gotta be, you know, when you go in the store. So you have all the options available to you when you make a budget, but it's gotta speak to the work plan. And like, if this doesn't jive, you're, you're, it's, you're, the likelihood of you getting the award is gonna be very low. Because when re like review panels in government or when foundation boards look at awards, the first thing they oftentimes look at is the budget to say like, okay, is this eligible? Is this reasonable? So start there, do yourself a favor, even if it's uncomfortable, um, do that first and then build everything else around that. So like the statement of need, like the project abstract, all that stuff can be written at the end. It doesn't need to be written first. Um, letters of support. So if you're applying for something that does require like a letter of support, um, just get that done early, uh, as early as you can, because you're depending on someone else to get you something. Um, so just a little note there, uh, you can even do the letters of support as part of the work plan budget process if you wanted. Um, and then forms and required documents. So one of the things that I always do is, and it, it, government grants are very document heavy, but foundation grants are too, because foundation Foundation funders are kind of waking up to like all of these organizations that are like running around with like their tax exempt status is expired or they've got like fishy financials. So foundations are now asking for more stuff, you know, three years of operating budget, uh, your current board roster, uh, your exempt letter, whatever it is, your bylaws, sometimes your operating agreements, you better have this stuff. You better know where it is or like who's in charge of knowing where it is. And you need to know that before the deadline. Like you don't want to be looking at the list of thing, all the attachments and stuff. You got to look at that, like front load that as much as you can. So that way, when it comes to crunch time, you're just really honed in on getting the things done that have to get done. And you don't have to worry about the miscellaneous stuff. So this is how I structure my process. It's, it's, it works for me. Um, you know, I, I pretty much always turn things in like the day they're due. <laughs> I try, I try, it's hard. Um, so just do your best, but also know that it's probably going to come down to a crunch. So you want to be as ready as you can um, and not miss the details, you know, in the chaos of, of trying to turn stuff in. So this is a proposal rubric. Um, we're all familiar with rubrics. And so I just, I just pulled this one because it was kind of a simple example uh, from the National Girls Collaborative Project. And you can see here, Across the top, you have like three, two, one. So those are points. And then you have the different, you know, areas that you're being evaluated. So the goals, are the project goals clear? And then this is key. Does the proposal support the goals of the funder? Very important. You're not writing the grant for you. You're writing it for the funder. So make sure you're aligned. Make sure you read that solicitation. Um, so if you do that well, you get a three. 
you know, project design? Is it strong? Is it fully explained? Use of best practices. These are pretty standard collaboration. Who are you working with? Um, foundations want to see collaboration. You're not the only person on earth that's trying to solve these problems. So like work with other people. <laughs> It'll help you. Um, and budget. Budget is key. And sometimes you'll see in a rubric, like things will be weighted. So, you know, maybe the project goals is like five points and the budget is five, like up to five points, but then maybe some of the other sections are weighted a little less heavily. So when you're reading the solicitation, you know, it's always with government funding, always, 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 this rubric is published in the solicitation and they will tell you what, what is important. So if they tell you qualifications of personnel is going to be 25% of your score, guess what? That section better be awesome, right? You can like make your other sections great, but what? It's only going to get you 10 points. Like we got to play this like it's a game, right? And that's why I love it because I'm, I'm a sports fan, like competitive writing. Um, so basically with this rubric here, you know, it's just one example. You know, you have six items. The most points you can get is 18, right? So when it comes to foundation funding, you know, there is a degree of like discretion and stuff, you know, but by and large, if they're using a rubric like this, the highest score wins. So the goal is to get a high score. And then, and then what they do is they rank the proposals and they go down the list of the rank. So the goal is to be above the line before the money is all given out, right? Like that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's what we're doing here in a very tactical way. Um, and when you think about that, it kind of um, focuses your attention on what's important uh, in your process because there's a lot you're managing here. Um, just some, some words of uh, advice, put yourself in the reviewer's shoes. Uh, one way to do this is to have people that are not so close to your work, like read your proposal. Um, because if someone can't make sense of what you're trying to say, like pretty quickly into the proposal, then it, it needs to, you need to work on it some more. Um, score your own work. So this is something we do when we, when our, um, when our center that I work for, when we apply for federal funding, I'll actually sit down and score my boss's proposal. So we can kind of guesstimate like where we're landing um, and then do a SWOT analysis of your submittal. So a SWOT analysis is like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, not, not so um, key here, but I think the strengths and weaknesses is like, what's really working here? Like, what is, you know, is it the qualifications of your team? Is it your history of success? Is it the fact that you already have some money in the bank that you're going to bring to the table? Like you want to make sure those strengths are like front and center for this funder. Right. And then if there are some weaknesses that you see, like, oh, our this budget doesn't make sense or the work plan is kind of run of the mill. Like how can we make it more innovative? How can we bring in a collaborator? Maybe you're weak on collaboration. Okay. Let's, let's work that and make it better. Right. So you have to kind of, you know, you have to interrogate your own, your own work. So that way, when you turn something into the funder, it's like as good as you could have made it. Right. Um, so that's rubrics are super important. Um, definitely a key to key to success. Um, I did have these two activities planned. So I think what I want to do is, is skip this activity, but let's do this one. So this is, uh, an actual page from the Atherton family foundation solicitation, so local foundation in Hawaii. And these are the elements of the narrative. So it should look kind of familiar. We just kind of went over some of the usual suspects. And so I want to give you a couple minutes. I'm going to give you two minutes. So even if you don't read through the whole thing, that's fine. Um, and think about this. How confidently could you answer these questions for your current organization or project? Which section of this narrative do you think would take the most amount of time to develop? And which section would you start working on first? So take a couple minutes um, and then we'll come back and we can talk it out.
Okay. So if you're still reading, that's fine. Um, initial impressions, confusion, excitement. Do you think you could answer some of these things like right off the bat for your organization or project that you're working on right now? I'm curious too, maybe on the other side, do you think this proposal is like identify, helping you to identify potential gaps of areas you might need to um, better develop in order to, you know, strengthen a proposal? Um, if so, which areas are you feeling maybe stuck on or needing more development with? That's all right. <laughs> we'll have time for dialogue. I can wrap up. Um, I have a couple more uh, slides for you guys, and then we can go till 1130 and just have it be open questions. And we can come back to this too. Um, but I really like this as a, um, you know, this is pretty much it. When you get into grant writing, you're just writing different versions of this over and over and over and over again. Hi, I actually did have a question and a yes. comment. Uh, this is Robin here. I'm sorry, my picture didn't work for some reason, but um, my voice, I hope, does. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. So my question was in terms of what would be easier or harder to, um, you know, to fill out. I think that kind of depends, as I was thinking about it, on whether it's an existing program that you're, um, you know, requesting money for or something that's brand new. And I think, you know, obviously the brand new piece would be a harder element to do in terms of the details because you, um, you know, you've done it before. But I guess that brought up a question. And the question is, how likely are these grant uh, giving places to um, allocate money to existing programs rather than new programs? I mean, do you have a feel for that one way or the other? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, hard to give you like a, a yes or no or like a definitive like ratio. But I think in my experience, you know, funders are are often always looking for like new grantees. So if it's your first time with a funder, I think that's a good opportunity to really lean on your strengths of like your existing work um, and kind of position, you know, in your pitch to that funder in the proposal, you're kind of positioning them to say, look at all the great work we've done. And with your help, we can do more, or we can pilot it in a new place, or we can reach a new, you kind of show them how they're going to help you expand the capacity of, of what you've already proven to be a successful approach. Um, uh, conversely, when you're with a funder for a while, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a funder that keeps encouraging you to apply, you kind of need to push the boundary on what you're pitching them. So that would kind of look different. It would be more like maybe in your organization, you know, mission and history section, you would talk about all the success that you've had and with that existing work. And then the problem or opportunity is kind of a riff on like, well, in the course of doing all that great work in the past, 
we realize there's actually uh, like an, an emerging need or there's this gap that no one else is addressing, you know, obviously your project's going to need to relate to your mission. So it's not like you're going from like arts education to like animal welfare, you know, just something that's like totally not <laughs> related. So I think you, you kind of spin that narrative like that. It's like either lean on your strength and then show the funder that you're pushing the boundary and like meeting new needs in the community. Or if it's your, if you're a first timer, you just, you just go hard on like, we know this works and we want you to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay. So I'm in a, no, um, I just uh -huh. want to ask one more related question to sure. that. You mentioned that there are contacts that, you know, often are indicated and you can, you know, ask, you know, call them up and ask a question. Yeah. Um, is it, is it appropriate to ever kind of run what you're going to potentially apply for to that person? Or is that not really a good thing to do? I mean, do they have the time to sort of listen to it and you say, well, I was thinking about, you know, doing something like this, you know, just off the top of your head, is that something that you think would be competitive for this grant? Yeah, I think by and large, it's, it's welcome. Um, I, I would encourage you to be prepared though. Like they can tell when people have not like read the instructions or anything. So just be prepared and put your best foot forward and obviously be respectful of their time and maybe even practice a little bit before you call. Like, I mean, there are people on the other end of the line, so it's, you know, but some foundations are like no phone calls. So like, don't call those people. Um, mm -hmm. but I think by and large, it's okay. Um, you know, it, even if it's like a procedural question or yeah, if it's like a fit, I mean, oftentimes, you know, when you call those folks, they're not going to tell you like, for sure. Or like, no, it's going to be like, yeah, sort of, you know, like, you know, sometimes it's, especially when you call the government, the government is like that. Um, they'll just tell you like, oh yeah, sure. It sort of sounds like it's in the ballpark, like go for it. So I wouldn't expect anything like very directive from them. Um, but it can be useful to call them, um, and, you know, just build that relationship. And if you really are thinking about things incorrectly, they can kind of put you on the right path. Um, but I don't think it's inappropriate. Just be prepared and make it concise. Great, thanks. Yeah, really good questions. Okay, so thank you guys for your, your patience and your attention. This is, as you can tell, I enjoy talking about this. Um, so grant winning, like what makes the difference? Um, these are common weaknesses. We've, I've alluded to many of them so far, so I won't spend too much time here, but one of the biggest weaknesses that funders state, uh, in terms of why they don't pick certain proposals is like the significance of the work and the impact. Like, I mean, for you, it might be a big deal, but like, why does the funder care? So you really need to make that case. And that's where you, you really dial in your work plan and like what it is you're going to achieve. And then also your statement of need. So that's kind of where those elements lie in the proposal. Number two, instructions are not followed. So read the instructions, uh, style, grammar, punctuation, you know, these things are learned with time. Um, but just don't make it sloppy. Like if there is like an ACE on your team, that's like the language person, like make sure that they have eyes on it before it goes in. Um, you know, the page is all you have with the funder to paint the picture. So if it's rife with errors, like, I mean, you know, if you see something with a typo, you're like, ah, there's a typo. You kind of, that suspension of disbelief is broken. So do make it clean. Uh, organization of ideas. So rule of thumb, someone should be able to read like the first sentence of every paragraph in your proposal and basically get the gist. If I can't do that, then it's, you're making it too difficult for the reviewer to find your, your main idea. So put it front and center. Don't hide it from them. They're reviewing hundreds sometimes of proposals. Make it easy. Uh, budget and work plan do not make sense. We talked about that. Make sure it makes sense. Do it first. And qualifications of the applicant. So don't slack on that because um, sometimes it really can be the difference maker. And these are just some of my words of wisdom. I'll just highlight a few, you know, put your best foot forward, strive for excellence. Everyone starts as a beginner at something. So just don't worry about what you don't know. 
Um, don't ask why, ask how. So grants oh. are like, <laughs> there's a certain degree of like pain <laughs> that goes with it. And you know, the opportunity cost of spending your time pursuing grants versus doing something else. So if you're going to walk that path, don't dwell on how bureaucratic it is and why is it this way? And why does the funder want it that way? It is what it is. So if that's the path you're going to walk, ask how you can be the best at it, right? Um, I think that goes a long way in terms of controlling the emotions as you go through the process. Um, target the right opportunities, focus on what you can control and assemble a team to help you. And so whether that's your internal team or a consultant, um, those are all things that will help you along the way. And I'll leave you with um, a couple things. So the learning curve, I'm in business school right now. Um, the learning curve is real. So, you know, on the y-axis, the average time spent per unit. So in this case, you know, finding a good grant or writing a proposal or even just creating a budget, you know, like when you do it for the first time, it takes forever. But once you have more attempts under your belt, it takes less time to do. And this is real. This is mathematically a real thing. Um, I'm an English major and I really <laughs> like that this is real, right? Because this is your source of confidence and motivation in grant seeking. And it's a steep slope, but you can handle it. And then eventually when you get to the flat part of the curve, you're going to look back and say, wow, like I've come so far. So just keep this in mind when you're feeling like overwhelmed and frustrated, like it's not just you, it's the process. Um, and you just got to, you just got to rinse and repeat and just keep trying if, if grants are something that's of interest to you. These are just a couple resources. I can leave this up. We can open it for questions. Um, we got five minutes. Uh, Practice makes improvement. The winning grant step-by-step -step book uh, is excellent. Um, I think it, I have a copy of it on my desk. Um, a lot of practical advice. So this was kind of an overview, very rapid fire advice from me, but this winning grant step-by-step -step is a really excellent resource. Um, there's another book listed here. And then if you're interested in like formal training and certification, there's three organizations here, um, that do excellent professional development. Um, so with that, I'll, yeah, I welcome your questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope this was helpful for you and I'm happy to, I don't know if we have a hard stop at 1130, but I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes longer if, if there's a lot of questions. So thank you. I do have a question on um, if someone solicits, you know, for you to write, you know, for them to write a grant for you mm -hmm. and they, what's like, would be like a good fee or what would be expected? Is there, is there guidance on that at all? Yeah. The, the uh, grant professionals association actually has like professional best practices around grant consulting. There's no one way to do it. Some people charge hourly. Um, you know, other people do like a package rate, like one proposal would be like a flat fee. I think the wrong way to do it is a portion of whatever you're asking. Like, let's say the client's writing a million needs a million dollar grant and you're going to say, Oh, I'm going to take a 1% or 2% take on your budget. And I, that's not right. Um, that's not the practice in the profession. Um, Frankly, depending on the readiness level of the applicant, a $10,000 application could be way more work than a million dollar application, right? Because if someone's going for a million dollars, they're probably pretty with it and, and ready. Um, so yeah, be, be weary of people that are like, oh, I'll write it for a portion of whatever the total award is. That is, that's in it, not ethical. Um, and yeah, you know, I think, so, you know, in Hawaii, like some people charge like 75 an hour, um, all the way up to, you know, $400 an hour. And when you're working with consultancies that are charging you, you know, four or $500 an hour, you have their team. You're getting the work of like five people. So, and the last thing I want to say to this is timeline. So grant writers get booked out like a year in advance. It's not really a mystery what the calendar is once you get to know the routine so get them locked in early because if you go to a grant writer and they don't have at least three months to work with you, there's got to be a premium, right? You know, like a rush job kind of thing. So just start early if you can. And I think you can get a good rate that way. Thanks so much, Megan, for all the great info. I think uh, earlier in the chat, Joseph asked, 
um, have any chapters received grants? Are there any chapters um, on the call today who've received a grant that want to share about their experience? Um, that's okay. Uh, I'll also mention that uh, Slow Food USA is very open to co-collaborating uh, when it comes to grants. Uh, maybe if it seems a little bit like bigger than what your chapter is, uh, potentially Slow Food USA could, um, you know, partner with a chapter in order to like reach goals and um, yeah, kind of like reach a, a larger audience. Um, so if you guys have any ideas or come across any grants, um, you can totally uh, email Anna or myself and we'd be happy to like help troubleshoot or um, yeah, read over your ideas. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for coming to this presentation. We really enjoyed having Megan here. Um, if you guys have any further questions for Megan, her email is listed on the last slide. And as you maybe know, uh, we'll have all of these recorded presentations uh, up for your uh, viewing in later times. Um, I think they should be available by mid next month. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to Megan or myself. And uh, yeah, we'd be happy to help troubleshoot. So thank you again. Really enjoyed this session.